Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Taking Stock Live with me, Kalila Reynolds. Very, very happy to be in your presence as usual. Where are you joining us from tonight? I love to see the comments. Let me know. I see a lot of early birds are in the chat as well. So comment below where you are from. And also remember to hit that like button. Super important. This is a business show that tells you all about the business happenings in Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the world, and how it will affect you and your money. Very, very important. Now, I want you to remember as well that you need to head over to our website, kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter to subscribe to the newsletter and get those emails directly to your inbox twice a week. What else do you need to do? Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Now here's a look at what's coming up in the program tonight, followed by what's hot in business. <music> Jamaica's first data science and artificial intelligence company, Star Apple, is on a mission to make Jamaica the global hub of technology innovation. And they want to IPO. We'll find out more from CEO of Star Apple AI, Adrian Dunkley. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. It's earnings season. What's on the horizon for investors? And Berger paints Jamaica still being severely impacted by the Russia and Ukraine war. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. EdTech company One and One raked in more than $3 billion in subscriptions from its initial public offer on Friday. The IPO closed just hours after it was launched. The company received nearly 17,000 applications for an offer that was seeking to raise just over $358 million. The shares available to the public were going at a dollar per share. 30 million shares were specially reserved for teachers and trainers. That pool was reportedly 10 times oversubscribed. Speaking on taking stock last week, founder and CEO of One on One, Ricardo Allen, said the company is focused on building out its technology and expanding its reach. The company is expected to release its base of allotment by August 22. Microcredit company Dollar Financial Services has expressed interest in acquiring competitor Access Financial. In a letter reportedly sent to Access's board of directors, Dollar has indicated that they are interested in exploring a takeover to acquire full control of Access. The letter also proposed that both companies enter a non-disclosure agreement to cover the likely discussions. Dollar, which was founded in 2017, is one of the newest members of the Jamaica Stock Exchange, having completed its IPO in June. Access Financial, which has been listed on the JSC since 2009, was recently granted approval by the Bank of Jamaica to operate as a microfinance institution. Dollar has given Access Financial until August 16 to respond to its expression of interest. The Jamaican government is facing backlash after revealing that it spent a combined $43 million on a failed campaign for Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith, to become Secretary General of the Commonwealth. According to a letter from the Office of the Prime Minister, eight. $18.2 million was spent on the minister's campaign that started in April. This included air and ground transportation, COVID tests, meals and accommodation, public relations, IT support, photography, food and beverages. Another $25 million was spent on the delegation, which included Prime Minister Andrew Holness and his wife Juliet, to attend the week-long Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit in Kigali, Rwanda in June. According to OPM, that cost was absorbed by three participating ministries. OPM contributed $12.8 million, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade $7.7 million, and the Ministry of Tourism $5.1 million. Digital payment solutions company Paywise Limited has been granted approval by the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago to issue e-money in the country. E-money refers to monetary value issued and stored on a card, mobile device or mobile wallet. Trinidad Central Bank issued a provisional registration to Paywise that will allow the company to onboard new customers in a controlled environment beginning September 1. Paywise will be the first company apart from banks and financial institutions authorized to issue e-money domestically. Paywise will allow individuals individuals to conduct customer-to-business, business-to-customer, business-to-business, and person-to-person -person transfers. Facebook's parent company Meta Platforms Inc. says it has raised 10 billion U.S. dollars in its first-ever bond offering. 
According to the company, the funds will be used to facilitate sheer buybacks and investments to revamp its business. The funds would help Meta, the only big tech company without debt on its books, to build a more traditional balance sheet and fund some expensive initiatives such as its Metaverse virtual reality. In late July, Meta posted a gloomy forecast and recorded its first ever quarterly drop in revenue, with recession fears and competitive pressures weighing on its digital ads sales. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Welcome back. Welcome back. Let me start out by shouting out those early birds who are on the program. Let me see who we have. And I see people are joining us here from all over the world as usual, starting with Radcliffe Green joining us from Portmore, Kayana, K Kayona Knight in Cave, Westmoreland. <laughs> Natty J.A. is a Jamaican living in Brooklyn. Big up yourself, Natty J.A. Kish, as usual, always one of our early birds saying hello, moneymakers, checking in from London, England. Navarro says, let's get this money. Govine is checking in from the Denham Town Police Station. Big up yourself there in Denham Town, Govine. And then Norma says, hi, everyone. Let's get this money. Checking in from St. Mary. I see there was one that, uh, oh, where is it? A new one. Antoinette Todd says, good night from Monsoon, Arizona. Woo! Is it hot there in Arizona like it is here in Kingston right now? Good night to you, Antoinette. Good to have you joining us this evening. So tonight's discussion is a very interesting one. It is a topic that we don't hear much of in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. It's a tech company called Star Apple. It's Jamaica's first data science and artificial intelligence AI company. Sounds very high tech, doesn't it? So Star Apple is actually on a mission to make Jamaica a global hub of technology innovation. I'm very curious to hear all about this. So I'm joined this evening by CEO of Star Apple. His name is Adrian Dunkley. Hi, Adrian. Hi, everyone. Yes, great Hello. to have you. Thanks for having me. All right. Good, good. So you got to tell me this story. Tell me all about what Star Apple does. Uh, sure. We deal in the future. So we ensure companies know what's going to happen before it happens and allow them to make the best decisions to capitalize on that future knowledge. So this includes knowing more than their competitors or knowing what their clients need before they need it. So we're basically leveraging their capabilities to make them better at what they do. Really interesting. So I need to hear more about it. Dealing in the future, yes, but get more specific. So you do artificial intelligence and was it data analytics? Uh, data analytics, data science. So AI is really about teaching computers to try to think as good or better than human beings. So think about when you talk to Alexa or you go on Amazon, it, and it recommends something for you. Or you go on Netflix and magically it has a movie that you like. Uh, the idea is it's using machine learning, AI in the background to figure out what you like and what you enjoy, and then using that to predict what you're going to like and what you're going to do before it happens. So it, it has massive capabilities in every industry, including investments and finance. And it's allowing companies and even countries to get a leg up over competitors very quickly. Data science is more the uh, practical application of AI. So you're looking more at domain experts like yourself, as well as machine learning AI experts working together to ensure that companies maximize their profits, reduce costs, and can manage their risks very effectively. So tell me how you got involved in all of this. Uh, sure. Uh, so comic books, TV, cartoons. Uh, I know it's pretty straightforward, but that was my into it. I used to see TVs, uh, robots on TV all the time and say, I want to build them. And then I realized there's a lot more involved in that. Uh, I went to school, studied very similar areas. And then I jumped into corporate for many years. Uh, liked it, didn't like it. Passion for tech really took over. And I decided to launch this company two years ago. 
And I'm very happy I did. And it launched it right as the pandemic came around. So it was a little bit rough for the team, but we made it through and we've been expanding ever since. So, so you were that nerdy kid who liked to play with computers, <laughs> huh? Yes, yes. And floppy disks. Uh, showing my niece a floppy disk <laughs> and my cousins, and they don't know what this is. or something. I'm like, no, that's, that's a USB. I'm like, what's a USB? To that point. So we've come a long way uh, in terms of technology and in the region. And that is we want to continue expanding our capabilities to be the global hub of technology. And I have to thank my grandmother for the name because it's it's because I heard that it's actually named Starable. So thank ah, you. Ah, what's the what's the story behind that name? Uh so when I was around I think seven or eight, uh she used to go to market every Saturday and she brought home an apple. So I love apples, I love water heaters. She brought me this ugly purple thing. She said, oh, it's a apple, try it out. So I said, nah, it's okay. I think I burst on her or something. So she gave me a knife. And that's the reason why I remember this, because it's the first time my grandmother handed me a knife, an actual knife, not just a little plastic thing. But, and I cut it open, and lo and behold, there's this shape on the inside. And it stuck with me because it was so amazed, and it's basically I'm begrudging this thing. And it's basically about there's more than meets the eye. There's more value and more to discover in things than when you look at it. You need to look deeper to get that value from it. So I thought it was the best name for the company. She didn't really like the name for the company either because the view was, you know, start up a certain reputation in country, uh, never falling on the ground. But our view is we're so valuable, we're not going to just fall on the ground, get picked up. You have to rise towards the value to actually pick it up. Interesting. That's a pretty cool story. Um, <laughs> so did you grow up in, you grew up in Jamaica? I did, I did, yeah. Uh, right, so here. getting into that tech space, right, here yeah. in Jamaica and growing up in probably, I guess, the 90s, based on your floppy mm -hmm. disk comment, I'm, I'm assuming around the 90s, what was that like trying to get into this space that I feel like not a lot of people were in? And even to now, 2022, not a lot of people here in Jamaica are in the tech space. People you would be trading certain things. You'd reach out to people in electronic stores and hobby stores trying to get certain things. You go to a pharmacy and look for electronics. Um, so I remember the first time I got that solder and iron, it was what you used to like put the circuits together. And that was like a big thing for me. That was like Christmas when I got something like that. I to actually utilize. Uh, we've expanded significantly, actually. There are a lot more technology companies in Jamaica and the diaspora has expanded so much that it's bringing a lot of that information and understanding back to Jamaica. Um, that's one of the reasons why we actually expanded outside because we have that diaspora network that can actually tap into to get in. We've we progressed pretty well. Uh, definitely more work to do. And you also studied this stuff in, uh, in college, right? I did. Uh, so I actually did mathematics and physics, electronics, and kind of jumped around. I did finance, economics, and some other things. But a lot of it was actually self-taught, right? Which is one of the reasons why in the company we don't require a degree as for any re any job, really. As long as you can do the work, you don't really care about your qualifications. Because I know what it's work. like to try and... Stop. You're working on your PhD now in what? I am. I am. Um, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Artificial so intelligence. I, so it's going to be yeah. Dr. Adrian Dunkley. <laughs> Yeah, my mother's going to be very happy about that. I'm sure. Jamaicans <laughs> love a PhD, boy, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, how much longer you have in the program? Uh, around a year left. Uh, mm. So looking forward to that. Yeah. So tell me about some of the projects that Star Apple has worked on so far, because you launched 2020, which is just two years yeah. ago, in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Good time for a tech company. Yeah, so we've been in marketing space, sales, we've done some work in manufacturing, a lot of work in terms of customer experiences, how to improve how, how you actually treat your customer, um, predictive metrics, predictive indicators, new forms of strategies. Uh, we've been working a lot in finance, we're expanding out into supporting B2B, other technology companies in the region as well. Uh, we've done some work in political science as well. And uh, we're expanding into different areas, sports, 
art, crime, uh, the whole gambit. Are you able to drop some names, like some companies that you've worked with already? Oh, uh, sure. So, RJ Agdino, uh, one of our first clients and uh, an investor. Uh, KPMG, Fujitsu. I think I can drop those for now. Uh, those are probably the ones people are most familiar with. So, mm. we have a lot more things planned coming up as well. So, you can watch out for that. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. my viewers would be familiar with the firm Blue Dot, led by Lauren Peart. They're a data intelligence firm. Uh, would you say your company has some similarities to what they do? Uh, yeah, so, we are actually expanding into the realm of market research. So, we are becoming a competitor for them. Uh, well, my view is every company is a competitor for us because we deal in information and every industry needs information, right? So we still watch out for emerging companies and entities that we can actually tap into potentially acquire as well. But we believe any mm. form of competition is going to be good for the market. It's going to be good for innovation. So we, we commend anyone coming into the space and trying to put a fire under us to do better. Right. I don't think that Blue Dot does artificial intelligence, though. And a lot of people are kind of skeptical or afraid of artificial intelligence. The image that comes to mind is like some kind of robot. And people don't really <laughs> understand what it means. They feel like, okay, robots are going to take over our jobs. So um, tell us about that aspect of it. Could this result in job losses? Is it a threat to traditional business? Uh, it will result in job losses, but it's going to create more jobs than it actually um, loses. And the idea there is think about the real world, road, for instance. Think about when you just had buses. Um, people did lose their jobs at a time, but think about the additional industries that actually out of it. Internet as well. The, the value that Internet had on all these industries. We have new, we have web developers as jobs, software engineers as jobs, um, digital marketers now as, as a whole profession itself. So AI is really about supporting human beings in doing the best that we can, as efficiently as we can. So it's supposed to really replace those and mundane jobs and allow human beings to focus on the jobs that rely on creativity. Because as good as AI is, it's never going to be able to match our level of creativity because there's, well, we're humans. There's a lot of erratic stuff going right. on in here. Um, so the idea is, yes, it will potentially swell certain persons from jobs, but it's up to you and up to the government as well to prepare its citizens to actually take advantage of these new industries. That's, that's extremely important. We need, uh, government support, um, to basically have the future. Troyan says robots are more efficient. KFC <laughs> needs some kiosk and get rid of the slow people there. <laughs> Uh, that's why I think we all have that problem, right? I, I would trust the robot to do certain stuff. Uh, not necessarily to cook my chicken because I feel like I wouldn't get it as right as I used <laughs> to cook it. No, I, I think he means in the in the customer service part. So selling you oh, the actual oh. item in the sales, the customer facing okay. part. Yeah, probably. That's very effective in China. But when you said not necessarily cook your chicken, robots are doing surgeries now. Yeah. There's yeah, that. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. Well, but you both, mentioned I, an important I, word. You mentioned a very important word, trust. So yeah. can we trust artificial intelligence? Because there have been data breaches in, in mm -hmm. countries around the world, and those types of issues come up. That, that's a great question. And it's, it's kind of like asking, uh, can you trust a shovel? Uh, it's really about how individuals are using it. it can, shovel can be used to create or can be used to hit people over the head. Um, so it's really about those bad actors, those people are using AI to take advantage of persons. So the example I like to use is think of the most intelligent person who decides to be a scammer. He could build a model to contact 100,000 persons a day. And this AI will try to manipulate them out of money. And even if it's 10% effective, this is one person doing that, right? But it's about the individual doing doing wrong with it, not necessarily AI actually doing anything mm. wrong. It's still it's still just a tool um, that we use to get to get an output. 
But it's very important for us as Jamaicans and Caribbeans to get involved from right now because what's happening is AI is being led from US, by US and China. We really have no say in how it's being developed and it's affecting our lives right now. Every time you go online, every time you like something or tweet something, you're getting an ad that's trying to manipulate you into buying something or incentivize you to do something else. So we need Jamaican representation in the space as soon as possible, which is what we're trying to do because they don't understand us over there because they're not building it specifically for us. I saw a great use of what I assume is AI just last week, week before last week with the one-on-one -on -one IPO, they had this thing called Una. Did you, did you see it? Are you familiar with I it? That. I missed that. Like, uh, so Una is, is kind of works like Alexa. So you could ask Una questions about uh, the IPO. So it okay. was on WhatsApp and, and I'm not sure what other platforms, but I know you could use it on WhatsApp and you just ask Una a question about the IPO. How many shares are on sale? How much do the shares cost? Or whatever you want to know, how much did one-on-one -on -one earn last year? And Una will recognize the keywords and answer your question. So that was pretty cool. I, I like that because, well, Jamaica, we're not really known for customer service, right? Yeah. Uh, AI can actually allow us to do more with less resources. I think that's a great example that they did there. Um, still get to that level of connection and um, not just reading our perspective, perspectives or our, our website, actually hearing somebody say it. So that's awesome. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the metaverse? Uh, I love it. Um, we're actually experimenting with it now. Um, I think it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for brands, very small brands, very big brands to effectively communicate and connect beyond what we've been able to do. But the risk is disenfranchising persons. And then one thing we're also researching is what is the potential impact it's going to have on our kids who grow up like this? Is it going to mm. put them in a position where they're antisocial, they can't really go outside or even congregate as humans? We still need that you know, uh, human connection and physical interaction. So a uh, double-edged sword. But uh, I'm excited about the positive benefits. All right, let me take some questions from the viewers, uh, starting with this one from Javon, who wants to know, what are some of the softwares or programs that you create? How does your company generate income through its activities? Uh, great. So currently, it's a mix of uh, very bespoke consulting. So we build machine learning models that make decisions in different areas. We also do curated training using gamified approaches as well. So we teach companies, we teach employees to analyze data, to report data effectively, to communicate strategically, and to make the best of their data assets, because data is an asset. Uh, when it comes to the consulting, we've actually expanded that out. So it's not just machine learning models per se, it's also tools that overall allow you to understand your customers better, because it's all about understanding what they want, what they need, and what they desire. If you can get all three, then uh, you can pretty much take over your industry. Next question comes from Reynaldo, who wants to know, do you train persons who are willing so that they can be able to work in your company as an intern? Yes, great segue. We, we actually do. Um, we have a program uh, called Sprout. So it's a Caribbean-wide internship program. And it's very different than other internships because you actually work on live projects and you work in a lab. Uh, it's a virtual lab uh, currently because everyone's remotely. But you work on projects that you have a passion for. So we have a sports lab that's been supported by that. We have an arts lab uh, as well as social good initiatives, finance and other areas. So we're not trying to make this complicated. Right, we're not trying to make data science like air complicated. We want everybody to be able to utilize this because our view is data science and AI should be an additional skill every human being has access to. Right, it shouldn't be a specialization per se. We want everyone to be able to develop a model for themselves. You're opening up a cosmetic store and you want to figure out the best mixing or colors to use. You're opening a patty shop and you want the best recipes but you want to have a, a day to figure it out. Uh, you want to open a sailboating company and you want to figure out the best route based on weather. 
these are all things that can be supported with AI and data science. Next question comes from Elaine, who asks, where do you see your company in the next five years? Ah, uh, uh, in many different industries. I actually have a wall of fail in my um, office, which are a few things that we tried over the last two years that didn't necessarily work out. Even though we call it the wall of fail, we're expecting to try these things over at a certain point. And uh, I always carry a few things around me to remember that, but we're trying to expand into real estate, manufacturing, finance, basically the main industries globally, because the idea is what we do supports every other industry. We just need to tap into companies that have something developed and then supercharge what they can do. Elaine wants to know, question that many people want to know, when is the IPO? Uh, do you plan on doing so, an IPO? So, yes, we do. We're getting pressure too. And uh, investors obviously want us to. And my my appetite is bigger than my, my mouth at this point. So the idea is we want to expand to all of these areas so quickly. We're going to need to figure out how to actually fund it, right? And the funding isn't just opening offices or expanding the market. It's also human capital because we want to make sure we're paying people not just on average, but above what they can get in other areas because we need to be able to support this in industry very effectively. So I mean, a yeah, year, it's a very high skill job, so you have to pay people well. Yeah, right. And uh, a big part for us is we absorb a lot of that initial expense because we're training persons from scratch to do this effectively in a Caribbean environment. When you're doing this in other regions around the world, it, it, there's a different type of requirement, a different way of approaching things. That's why it's a little more difficult for companies to come into the Caribbean and just offer AI services. They, they, they miss a lot of the nuances and, and requirements of the Caribbean when they're doing what they're doing. But the uh, earth to earth. Mm. Imagine off, off, ordering your KFC without the attitude. Ah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> And you can train it to, to understand yeah. Jamaican language. If it can understand yes. other languages, why can't it understand Jamaican patois? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah exactly. What was I going to ask you about? Oh, so timeline on potential IPO. Do you have a timeline on that? Yeah, one year to two years around that. Oh, we're still, fairly we're quick. still discussing. Yeah, so the idea is with the expansion into the US, that's going a lot better than expected. And the whole point of the IPO was to support further expansion. So we're trying to gauge the initial success, see exactly how much how much funds do we actually need to get. Because we're trying to get into Africa, trying to get into Canada, and a lot of other areas as well. You're so, doing a lot very, very quickly. How many people do you currently have on staff? Uh, around 10, 10 to 15. Uh, ex team, if you're watching, excuse me for not knowing the exact count. It's not that I don't care. <laughs> Just on the air, I don't. Know. So ten to fifteen, I don't. Are, are yeah. you currently profitable? Uh, we are. We are. Um, not where I want us to be. We have very high aspirations for this year, but we have until March to meet those aspirations. Uh, but so mm -hmm. far, we're going to be hitting our targets for March. So I'm happy about that. And you mentioned about U.S. subsidiary and exporting talents outside the Caribbean. Tell us how that's been yes. going. Uh, it's been going wonderfully. Um, Where the in the U.S. Years, did you open? Uh, so we opened up in Florida. So that's the first office in the U.S. Trying to open up another two, Central and uh, in the North. Uh, depending on how well things go for the rest of the year, but been very happy with the work so far. Um, the team's great. We're we're really a we're a Jamaican team, but we're our US subsidiary is actually filled up with Jamaican diaspora as well. So we're still keeping it still at home, really. Still yard. Yeah. Uh, so we're happy about that as well. You mentioned earlier about an investment from RGR Gleena Group. They invested in Star Apple, so they're yes. an equity investor in you. Yeah. Can you say what percentage? Uh, they did a uh, fifteen percent. Uh, so cash helped. The operational support's helping. The expertise very big. Uh, having a board on, having a 
a very good board, a very experienced board. Uh, not calling anybody on the board old, but they have more experience than I've been alive. So it's very helpful. But at the same time, having a board that gives you that that leeway to expand and express yourself, right? So even when I went to them about, okay, let's let's try some stuff with like star apple juices. They're like, okay, just don't spend too much money trying to figure it out. So very appreciated that from them. Well, that's great. I'm happy that you have some institutional support. Philip wants to know some numbers. I was staying away from asking, but Philip wants to know, can you give an idea of your revenues? You did say that you are profitable. Yeah, I can say that we are on track for 500K by the end of our financial year. And uh, a little more US, hints. 500K yeah, US. US? Yeah, US. Uh, that would be revenues? Yeah, revenues. Uh, but our aspirational target is triple that. A little more hints. I'd say retention is at max. Are at max as well. Uh, profit margin about fifty percent. Just to above fifty percent. Nice. Yeah. So you're able to do a lot with a fairly small staff. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is the same approaches and techniques that we've applied for clients is what we apply internally. So we learn fast. If we fail, we just move on to something else. Um, but that is learn as much from the data as possible. Gut feeling is fine, but we're always ensure we include data science in there. We include research in our decision making. So you can have the craziest idea, such as star apple juice and if you can see that and uh just try it out if it doesn't work out then you know move on to something else as long as you don't lose too much it's a learning experience a strong link says getting ready for shark <laughs> tank <laughs> yeah yeah I, I probably should i probably should the great show i mean hey why not give it a shot yeah. and you know they're gonna ask those questions on shark tank so i love that show by the way well, thank you so much, Adrian, for joining us. And I wish, you, I wish you much success on the expansion of your company. I look forward to hearing more about the things that you're doing. And of course, give us a shout when it's IPO time. Okay. Thanks, Khalil. I really appreciate it. Um, Jamaica, uh, look out for us. We're here to help as well. So www.starup.ai. Uh, if you have any ideas, just feel free to reach out. All right. Thanks again, Adrian. So viewers, while you are watching, make sure that you hit the like button. If you haven't done so yet, I see 242 people live right now. I don't see 242 likes. So go right ahead and hit that like button and share this video in your WhatsApp group, on Facebook, wherever you like to watch. Let other people know that we are live right now. Up next, we've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap. The JC Combined Index lost more than 5,000 points or 1% last week. 121 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week ending Friday, August 12, 2022. 47 advanced, 62 declined and 12 stayed the same. 86 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, valued at $440 million. Dollar was the most traded stock, taking up 20% of market volume. People bought and sold 17 million shares in the company. The stock gained 33 cents to open this week at $3.25. The increase in trading for dollar follows news that dollar is seeking to acquire a major competitor, Access Financial Services. Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary Shares traded the second highest volume, with people buying and selling 10 million shares in the company. The stock opened this week at 52 cents. And Sagicor Select Funds Financial rounded out the most traded, taking up 6% of market volume. Almost 6 million shares traded. The stock's price remained unchanged at 45 cents. Now let's see who had the biggest gains for the week. PBS 9.75% Cumulative Redeemable was last week's biggest gainer, up 43%, to open the new week at $156.05.
PBS, one of the leading tech companies in the Caribbean and Central America, was on last week's episode of Taking Stock to explain their new perpetual cumulative redeemable preference share offer. Access Financial was last week's second biggest gainer, up 23% to open this week at $25.39. This could be tied to the news we mentioned earlier about dollar seeking to acquire access. And rounding out our biggest gains, Cygnus Real Estate Finance USD is up 19% to open Monday at $0.13 cents US. On the losing side now, First Rock Real Estate Investments USD was last week's biggest loser, down almost 27% to open Monday at $0.05 cents US. Cygnus Real Estate Financial JMD was the second biggest loser, falling 18% to close last week at $9.73. And JMMB 5.75% FRUSDCR preference shares were down 15% to close last week at $1.74 US. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the composite index declined by 18 points last week. First, Caribbean Bank was the most traded stock. It opened this week at $5.01 TT. Angostura Holdings was the market's biggest gainer, up almost 5%, to open this week at $26.25 TT. And on the losing side, Port Lisa's Industrial Port Development fell almost 10% to open the week at $3.06 TT. In the U.S., the Dow Jones, S&P, and the Nasdaq were all up almost 3% last week. Over at the pumps, motorists saw $4.50 drop in gas prices last week, as well as a $4.50 drop in regular diesel and a $0.25 cents drop in ultra-low sulfur diesel. In foreign exchange, it took an average $152.46 Jamaican to purchase one U.S. dollar last Friday. That's $1.24 less than last week Friday. And on the crypto markets, Bitcoin's momentum slowed this week, gaining just over half a percent in the past five days, compared to almost 6% last week. The cryptocurrency was trading at 24,109 US dollars on Monday. It was the same for Ethereum, which is up just over 3% in the past five days, compared to 11% last week. The cryptocurrency was trading at $1,910 on Monday. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica National Group. We'll help you find a way. All right, welcome back. Time now for The Analysts. But just before that, let me take a couple of comments. So Elaine says that dollar announcement had the market on fire. And you saw that indeed in the, um, in the market recap just now, which brings us to our poll question for this week. And the poll question is... How do you feel about the news that Dollar Financial has expressed interest in acquiring Access Financial? How do you feel about that news? Let us know. Take our poll on YouTube and also on Twitter. How do you feel about that? Were you buying? Were you selling? I saw it also impacted the stock price for Access Financial as well. So, yeah, people are watching the news, seeing what is going to happen. How is Access going to react when that time comes, when they do respond Will it be positive? Will it be negative? Uh, let's keep watching it. Definitely very interesting times ahead. I think I had another question that I wanted to take. No, that was it. That was it. All right, that was the one. All right, so let's get into our analyst discussion. I'm joined now by Head of Asset Management at JN Group, Hugh Miller, and business writer at the Observer newspaper, David Rose. Hi, Hugh. Hi, David. Good night, Kalila. Kalila. Good evening to your viewers. How are you guys doing? I'm well, I'm doing all right for the most part. <laughs> all right. Good, good, good. Well, let's look at a couple of things happening locally and internationally. There have been some concessions made between Russia and Ukraine uh, regarding the whole supply of grain to the rest of the world, which is a very important issue. But uh, the destruction in the Ukraine continues to impact at least one local company, and that's Berger Paints Jamaica. Berger relies on titanium dioxide from the Ukraine in order to produce paint. So tell us what's going on with Berger Paints, David. So Berger Paints had their annual general meeting recently, and they expressed mm -hmm. the concern that, you know, because of the Russia-Ukraine war, they are kind of seeing the difficulty in sourcing titanium dioxide. Like, I didn't understand or appreciate the value of it in the creation of manuf or the manufacturing of paints. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the finishing, in terms of the coating, like for white, white materials especially, 
it's critical in getting that shine or sheen in a sense. So that's just one issue that they faced in recent times. And they've also pointed out the fact that you have other rubber materials, you know, which are probably taking longer to arrive. And on top of that, although they said, you know, supply chain disruptions have actually somewhat abated in a sense, the costs are still highly elevated. So even if the difficulty in sourcing goods has kind of eased back up and make it a little and come a little bit easier, elevated costs are still impacting them. Because actually is a reason why they said they're going to be very cognizant of whether they should consider a dividend even shortly, because as they're pointing out, working capital is being put more to work because of the current environment. Mm, so yes, it's boy. I don't know what's what's gonna happen with this situation, how long it is going to, to drag on, David. We have earning season also right here locally. And Hugh, you've been following that. What's on the horizon? Uh, looks like we need to get back Hugh. Because I'm oh, not sure where right. I'm not sure what's going on with the Wi-Fi tonight because I had turned off my internet and come back log back in a while ago. I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, that's the All least. Right. Hopefully we can get him back soon. In the meantime, I have some comments that I didn't want to take from the viewers and maybe have some some insight on this as well. David, somebody was asking, where is the comment? Let me find, let me find, let me find, let me find it. Oh, strong link wanted to know. Uh, when is the one-on-one? -on -one, when is one-on-one -on -one expected to list on the stock exchange? Do you remember the timeline they have given? No, so it's uh, so the timeline is five, sorry, six business days for the base development to be produced, which is tells you know how many shares you're expected to get based on your application. Then you know it's supposed to have refunds within ten days, and you know once the Jamaica Securities Listing Committee meets, they should list within five days after that. So it could easily be early September because the refund or sorry, the base development is in should be ready until probably next week Monday, and even then we still probably not see it come out until you know probably it's the eighth of or September around that range because dollars IPO closed on May 27, and they listed on June 15. So that kind of seems like, you know, probably two, three weeks in a sense. Uh, but, you know, as I said, we don't know the JS listing committee's meeting as yet, because, you know, the broker indicates still has to process the orders, and I heard it was quite a number of orders. So, but as I said, probably around September 8, around that period, we should probably see one on one listing on the JSC. Once the JSC listing committee approves the listing, that's the mm -hmm. key part. Right, right. All right, so Hugh is back. Welcome back, Hugh. Yes, good to be back. The technology went down. I'm in the office. I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, so we're looking at earning season. What should we be looking out for this earning season? Okay, well, I would say what we should be looking out for is, is a confirmation of an emerging trend, which I think we saw um, on the eve of covid in that they, they, there's, a, there's a structural shift that, that we're seeing in the market. And it actually started from the, the Trans-Jamaica IPO, that, that massive IPO back just in about February, March of 2020. And the, the structural change we're seeing, Kalila and David, is that they, with the retail investors exerting themselves in the market, what we're now seeing, which is evident in this earning season, is that unlike you know prior years, prior earnings season, where you'd see a broad-based rally in the market, the retail investors who don't have the kind of deep pockets as like an institutional investor, they're targeting their investment dollar to specific stocks. And I would say primarily stocks for which they, in terms of when the company articulates its, its vision, it, there seems to be an element of innovation. And so therefore, when we look at the, the earnings that came out in, in July, early August, a lot of the companies, the financial sector, manufacturing, the conglomerates seem to have recouped the, the losses that they would have made, at, you know, based due to COVID. So in a sense, the not net profit is back to the pre-COVID levels are higher. However, the stock price has not responded because the retail investors are now dominating the space. And it's just say so just you know that's one big observation I just want to put on the table. What we have noticed in the earnings season so far, so it's not a broad-based 
um, recovery in the market, but it's very specific to, to certain stocks. So which stocks are these? You said certain stocks, which, which certain stocks? Oh, so where we're seeing the vibrancy actually is primarily on the junior market and not the, the, the main market. Let me give you a quick contrast. If you look at, for instance, JMB came out with some very strong numbers. So they, they have come in for their six month numbers well above their pre-COVID levels. Same thing for cement, same thing for Sepra. The prices have not responded, you know, commensurately. However, the, the stocks that we have seen do well are primarily on the junior market. So in, I heard the interesting discussion about the IPO earlier, one-on-one -on -one and so on. So it's it's actually junior market stocks that have actually demonstrated any kind of commensurate response in terms of price relative to the to the performance. So that is the kind of you know structural change that we have seen, and it's something to look look at closely because it's a uh, it's it's very new for this type of market. Last thing I have to say, Kalila, is that the reason why I pointed it out as I heard your market recap earlier. And it, you know, at the at the headline, it indicate that the the index, you know, might have been down or might have been flat, but but underneath that, in terms of that top line, as well as what the index did and it, and continues to do, there are companies that are actually performing well. So, for instance, the performance of GMB, uh, Seprad, Cement Company, that to be lost because they. The, the drivers for the market have changed. And they, in the past, it's the, it's the big financial sector firms that make up about 50% of the main index. If those did not move, then you would not hear a newscast saying that the, the index has, has rallied. So, but, but because the retail investors are, are not focusing on those, you know, those long established companies, then it's a, it's a different dynamic. I think you will see for, for as, as this earning season rounds out and as, as other earning seasons come around. Rosewell Campbell, one of our viewers says, these investors are not responding to good company results. America In America, persons respond to good results. Uh, why is that you think, Hugh? Well, the, the, the dynamics of the market is different. So even though, even when we went into, you know, our first case was announced in March, 2020, Everyone ran for the hills in Jamaica. They did the same thing in the U.S., but to the extent that the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve would have provided, uh, it's almost like a safety net, you know, they've provided these, these, these checks. It, it allowed the U.S. investors, especially retail investors, to come back in the market because they had a safety net. You're getting a four, five, six hundred U.S. dollars for the month. So in the U.S., the reason... He froze again. Hopefully we don't lose him. But in the interim, let me take this comment from Strong Link. And David, perhaps you can weigh in here. He says, rumblings indicate that the main market is getting ready to explode. You are right. The main market sleeps, albeit good company results, just a matter of time. So investors must be patient. Would you agree with that, David? David freeze too. <laughs> Oh boy, what is going on? All right, or is it me? I tell you, what is going on? Somebody mentioned earlier that it seems Flo is giving trouble. Flo is having some problems and we are losing, uh, you know, internet connection. So let me just take some more of your comments and hopefully I am actually on. They both went. Okay, so I am on. So Troyan says it's easier for $1 to triple than a hundred dollars. There were lots of comments about Dollar Financial earlier. Troyan was saying something I like about this company. Strong Link was saying explore the crypto sector too. That's what he was saying, or his advice to Star Apple. And then Strong Link also mentioning that Bitcoin is so volatile. And you saw that in our market recap. Our guests are both back. David, Hugh. I won't even ask you which uh, which service provider <laughs> you guys have. I'm just Hello. happy to have Hello. you both back. Hello. Yes, I'm back. Um, see if the technology is a little um, spotty. Apologies. 
Right. So I was asking, I don't even remember what question I was asking you, who I think it was one of the You were questions. asking about the dynamics on the market. So he was so he was referencing the JMBs and so forth, and he was speaking to the US market and how the Federal Reserve gave some protection to the Americans. Right. No, I think he had responded to that point already. So you added um, to my comments, David, or no, because he went same time as you. Both of your internet uh, went at the same time, so we didn't. David, can didn't you hear to... me? Yes, I can. Yeah, we can yes, all I can. Hear you now. Okay. We can all hear you now. So let me. Not you and Kalida, comment. so I'm just doing a quick check. Oh. All right. I think I had unstarred the comments. Anyway, so we're talking about earnings season and what people can expect right now. David, and I think when you left, I was asking you whether you agreed with the sentiment that the main market is preparing for an explosion. I wouldn't call it an explosion, but the reality is that the dynamics of the main market have completely shifted. So for many quote-unquote investors, for some companies, the earnings have just slowed down or haven't fully recovered. And in other contexts, if you're a person looking for dividend income, some of these stocks have been holding and when a person dividend income, so for example, NTV Financial Group, or in a sense, uh, you probably are looking at the quantity that you can purchase with the limited amount of capital they have. So as somebody would say, it's easier to get, for example, uh, 10,000 units of a stock at $1 versus getting, what, I think it's $200, 200 units of a stock at $50. So... Yeah. I believe that, you know, kind of, sorry, 2,000 units, sorry. But the kind of basically is persons get more units at cheaper prices for some stocks relative to other stocks that I mean, are trading for, you know, 30, 40 and above. So that's kind of the reality that we're seeing because when you consider the fact that one or one dollars IPOs are seeing more than $3 billion in subscriptions and, you know, some residents are taking or source and positions in the market to actually enter those um, IPOs, it kind of shows that persons are looking to find ways to make their money grow a lot faster through trading. And, you know, it's easier to accomplish that, especially when these prices at a lower nominal price. And as Hugh pointed out, we are not seeing certain interest investors, you know, where in a sense, we're not seeing the capital volume, in a sense, which would be typical from interest investors entering the market. You heard I'm seeing transactions between one or two parties, but not as frequent as you would have probably seen in the pre-COVID times. So, so you, you don't see a number of block transactions where you know you don't see like we're value traded in a context. Right now, we're just seeing the reality where a uh, lot of investors are just, or the retail investors are focused on making the most value in a shortest period of time versus institutional investors who are preserving capital and looking for less risk in this environment because. For example, Barita recommended the PBS preference share because of the risk, attract, the attractiveness of the risk relative to the yield. So that's just my context. Mm. I think we're still having some problems with Hugh. We're still having some technical issues with you know everything that's going on. So we're going to leave this segment there. We, we covered a lot, though. So thank you for joining us, David. Thank you for joining us, Hugh. That's it for the analysts. When we come back from this very quick break, I'm going to take some final comments from you, our viewers. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, was brought to you by Jamaica National Group. We'll help you find a way. Hey, moneymakers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit kalilorenolds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. Let's get this money. All right, a few comments from the viewers, also reminding you to hit the like button, the show soon finish. So if you haven't done it yet, now is the time. So here's some comments from our viewers. Strong link says, what will Proven have to say about that? And he's referring to the proposed takeover bid, uh, dollars proposed takeover bid of Access. Remember that Proven owns, what, what is it, 20% of Access Financial? So he wants to know what will Proven have to say about this proposal. Roswell says, Dollar is a young company, but never underestimate this company's growth trajectory 
and the many business avenues to create value for shareholders. She was actually responding to another comment I saw, I can't find it back right now, that was saying that the deal will never go through. So Roswell is saying, you know, never underestimate. And then Troyan says, pension funds need to spend some money in the market. That was in response to comments made by Hugh earlier. Elaine is waiting patiently on the one-on-one -on -one listing storm with that cash. So you guys are marking down your calendars till late August, early September to see when that listing occurs. Roswell again says, I love the many discounts I see on the junior market. Let them sell. <laughs> so you're taking advantage. Happy that you have the cash stored up to do so, Roswell. And then we have Javon saying the main market produces better yields and is a little less volatile than the junior market. However, the junior market is a great growth avenue. So it all depends on what you are looking for in your investment. Are you looking for yields? Are you looking for dividends and consistency? Or are you looking for that high growth opportunity? That is one of the big differences between main market and junior market. More established companies that are kind of done with their growth phase, their rapid growth phase, but they're consistent, they're tried and true, they pay good dividends versus the younger companies that are going up and up and up, which of course is a riskier investment. So what is it that you're looking from your investment portfolio and how much risk are you comfortable with taking? That is going to be our show for this week. Reminding you once again to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and of course, subscribe to the newsletter and share with a friend. The newsletter is at kalilarunnels.com slash newsletter. You will get a copy of our What's Hot in Business newsletter tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And reminding you that new email subscribers also get a copy of my free broker guide that can help you decide which broker might be right for you. Turn on those post notifications on YouTube and Facebook. That's the little bell icon so that you can be the first to see everything that drops on this channel. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. And encouraging you also to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kalila Ray. It's fun over there. Did you see my video today? I don't work for money. Money works for me. I have a few others drop in this week as well. And follow at KRM underscore business news on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. And also visit my website, kalilareynolds.com, for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. Now, I'm encouraging you to tell a friend about taking stock because investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Let's get this money. Let's get this money.